Uh, my name is David. <clears throat> I'm here, I guess, with a bunch of groups today, so I'll just list my multiple identities. Uh, and thank you, uh, thank uh, the local organizers, which include No One Is Illegal London, Council of Canadians, Common Cause London, the London District Labour Council, um, I forget the city, Health and Training, Council of Canadians, Council of Canadians, No One Is Illegal, SPHR, SPHR that's what we said, so, so Solidarity with Palestinian Human Rights. Um, among the local groups that are uh, sponsoring this. Um, and I would like to begin <clears throat> by reminding us and recognizing that we are on the territory of the Adirondra, among other First Nations, the Adirondra neutral people um, in this area. So we are also on occupied land. Uh, I will be brief because I really want to hear from these folks. I uh, just wanted to say that People for Peace London was involved in an event, and I'm trying to remember, I think it was seven years ago, uh, at the London Muslim Mosque when we had uh, the family of Mr. Jabala, who was one of the men on the security certificates, visit us here in London at a time when they were, uh, the five of them, uh, in detention under this very unjust law. Uh, a very moving experience for us here uh, in the peace movement and the solidarity movement. And in 2006, we took part in a, the caravan against their security certificates through Eastern Ontario that went to the Supreme Court when it was eventually found unconstitutional. Of course, the government found a way to make it legal again, or sort of legal again. Uh, and just one moment from that that will stay with me for a very long time. We were accompanied uh, for a part of that by James Loney, who was some of you met. Uh, James was with the Christian Peacemaker teams in Baghdad and was kidnapped in Baghdad. And while he, was, while he and three others were in, in captivity, um, there was a statement, a, very, or a number of statements, but one very powerful statement came from the five men in Canada on security certificates, who said very simply, these men stand for justice, they should not be imprisoned. We are imprisoned unjustly, they, we should, they should be freed as well. Uh, we went with James to the door of Kingston Penitentiary, uh, which was as far as we could get at that time, um, uh, to read James read, read his statement against security certificates. Um, I'm very happy to be able to welcome one of uh, the, the then security certificate five, finally able to travel here. Uh, it's a pleasure to have, uh, have our speaker here tonight. Um, it's also a source of great uh, shame and anger that this law is still on the books in this country. It's fundamentally an unjust law. So I'm going to leave it at that uh, and introduce the first speaker from the Justice for uh, Mahmoud, Mahshoud uh, Coalition, Sayyid Hassan, who will be followed by Mr. Mohammed uh, Mahshoud himself. Thank you. Thank you, David. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, so Mr. Benji was going to go into detail about his personal story and the impacts of it. Uh, seems to be someone at the door. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, as a member of the support committee, try and situate this in the context of what security certificates are, what these laws are, what they mean, and what they have meant um, for people. So I just want to start off by being very, very clear. What we're talking about today is terrorism. We're talking about the terrorizing of Muslim communities by the Canadian state and the Canadian government. And when we look at these policies of silencing, we look at these policies of uh, demonizing, we look at these policies of separation and torture, we're actually seeing policies and practices that the Canadian government has practiced over centuries, in particular against the indigenous peoples of this land. So when we talk about people being uprooted, when we talk about particular cultural communities being pushed aside, when we talk about people being jailed endlessly, when we talk about a, what is essentially in many ways, you know, a cultural and an imperial project um, that has been worked on, that has been practiced on, that has been perfected against the indigenous nations of this land. So we have to understand our work in the context of that. But not only that, because when we're here, and we are here because in, a, in, a, in a struggle for resistance, we do so inspired. We do so inspired because we are walking on a path that has been set for us by centuries of indigenous communities from, you know, from across these lands who have actually fought back against this repression, fought back against these policies, fought back against these practices. So we are inspired by that. Our work as social movement activists, no matter what it is that we would be doing, could not have happened if the indigenous nations here had not struggled to survive, to resist, and to continue with courage and with dignity. And when we talk about courage and dignity, I want us to also focus on the fact that we're here to talk about a very particular one person's struggle for justice, one struggle's courage. 
Because for 12 years, Mr. Majoub has been silenced. For eight of those years, he's been put in imprisonment. For four of those, he's been put um, under you know, atrocious house arrest conditions. And the first time, just this past March, when these conditions were actually softened, where he could actually speak to some people that weren't on a list, where he could actually leave the Toronto area, he has gone on the speaking tour. And we've now gone into seven cities where Mr. Majoub is telling his story to, you know, to speak back against the struggle, I'm sorry, to speak back against the attacks on him, which are actually symbolic of an entire immigration system. So I want us to honor this. I think that what we're all participating in is actually <clears throat> a victory. We're here celebrating courage and human dignity for a person who has been silenced for so long, willing and able to speak for us. So first of all, I want to you know, mark that and acknowledge that. So let's just talk about what are security certificates. Security certificates are a legal measure. They're a legal process by which an individual can be indefinitely detained without charge so that they can be deported. Now this is extremely important. There are no charges that have ever been laid in this case. Mr. Manju has never been charged. Okay? Now, what they are being arrested on is that they are being arrested on the basis of profile. What that means is that they are accused, accused of a crime, but accused of matching a particular type of person. A type of person who could possibly be associated with someone, or who could possibly at some point in the future carry out so-called terrorist acts. What does that mean? What type so we're not talking about actions, we're talking about a profiling. And this is no different from the everyday profiling that police in our communities do when they go out and they grab people of color, they grab indigenous people, and they try and arrest them. The difference is that the police actually tries to hide the fact that they are racist. While as in the security certificate case, they don't. It is actually legal. It is an entire system that's based on explicitly, formally saying that there is no presumption of innocence. Okay? The court has actually said in Mr. Majoub's case, the federal court, that the presumption of innocence simply does not apply. Because we're not talking about um, because we're not talking about guilt or innocence, we're talking about assessing potential danger. Now what does that potential danger mean? What type of person does Mr. Majoub fit? A Muslim man. And so in a country where that sheer fact is grounds enough for indefinite detention. That's what the security certificate is. It formally legislates that process. Okay? Now, that's the aspect of profiling. No charges are laid. You're supposed to just be somebody who could possibly at some point do something. Right? No details, because it's not clear that there will be questions of terrorism. It's not clear that there will be questions of national security. It is not even clear or alleged what kinds of actions would take place. Just that some might. Okay? On the basis of a profile. Now, not only is that, you know, that is one of the primary issues with the security certificates, the other thing to remember is that this is a two-tier justice system. Now, first of all, we have to understand that security certificates are not part of criminal law. They're part of immigration law. Okay? Now, immigration by definition is a two-tiered system. It is a system where people have two sets of rights. <laughs> Basically, based on where they were born. <coughs> so if you're born in another country, i.e. you're a non-citizen, until you get status, you can easily be, you, you're just treated differently. That's the immigration system. It's two-tier. Now, within that, the security certificate is also a two-tier system. What that means is that people who are citizens cannot be arrested in the security certificates. That means only permanent residents, refugees, um, tourists, students, anything but citizens. So, which we have to ask ourselves, why is it that there is this one system where you can be detained without charge, uprooted, deported, tortured, even to a, and, you know, removed to a place of permanent risk only on the basis of the place you were born in? Okay? Now, and without there ever being any clear opportunity for people to clear their names. Now, when we talk about security certificates, we have to understand that they are actually just the spearhead of the everyday injustice that exists in the immigration system. And so we're going to talk a lot about what it means to move beyond the immigration system, what it means to be in a place where these security, sorry, where these security certificates do not exist. But for us to actually receive complete full justice, we need to move away from an immigration system that excludes people. Right? Because any system that is one of inclusion and exclusion simply cannot function. Okay? 
So let's spend a bit of time to talk about process. How does a security certificate work? Basically, CSIS, the Canada uh, Security Intelligence Service, the, um, Canada's wannabe CIA, um, writes a secret report. No details again. It's a secret report, and it's given to the Minister of Immigration and the Minister of Public Safety. They look at it, and in this secret report, it's claimed that this person is a potential threat. Remember these words, potential threat. Um, and is therefore inadmissible to Canada. So basically, they should be kicked out. The person is then immediately arrested. They are indefinitely detained unless we can somehow convince a federal court to release them on egregious house arrest conditions. While they, you know, wait and wait for what? So, and by this point, the mainstream media has started referring to these people on security certificates as terrorist suspects. So, not people who are actually terrorists, not people who have carried out any acts, but people suspected of future actions. Um, and what happens is that the federal court actually then gets up and decides whether this certificate is reasonable. Okay? So it's not, oh, you are found guilty. It's found whether the certificate is reasonable. Now, the federal court process, which actually decides this, has, is so broken that in 2007, the Supreme Court of Canada actually ruled that the federal court process was unconstitutional. The entire security certificate regime was tossed out, and 364 days later, one day short of the year that the Supreme Court had given the Canadian government, they brought the legislation back with one cosmetic change. They basically added a veneer of um, legitimacy by adding something called a special advocate, a special advocate is somebody, a third party lawyer, who can now see this secret information. Remember, this is not evidence because there are no charges. Um, who may be able to look at the information, however, cannot in any way communicate with the detainee or their lawyers. Okay? Now, in the federal court, they have this notion of basically any information, any test of information goes. So, what, for example, there's this notion of triple hearsay. So you can say that you heard something from someone else, who heard it from someone else, who heard it from someone else, and therefore is now put in as information. Websites, blog posts, journal articles, unsourced information, all of those are acceptable. Right? So what that means is you, know, you have a neighbor who just happens to be angry, or some racist is out there ranting based on no facts, no information, can write anything. It can then be used as information in the proceedings to determine whether this is reasonable. The standard of proof is so low that the only thing the government has to show is reasonable grounds to believe. Now usually, I'm sure we've all seen this in the movies, you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Here it's reasonable grounds to believe that this security certificate is reasonable, that is this person matches a profile of someone who might someday do something. That's, the, that's actually the formal law. right? It's ridiculous. Um, and that's how it works. And then if the circuit's upheld, then the person is deported. Now, as if this legislation was not broken enough, as if the system was not broken enough, there have been multiple so-called scandals. So for example, um, the Canadian Secret Intelligence Services and the government bodies have been found lying to the court. There are actually affidavits where CSIS was like, yeah, you're right, we lied. Um, They've uh, forgotten evidence like one of the people they were presenting as a witness kept failing all the lie detector tests. One would think that would be important. Um, Mr. Bajib is going to go into detail on this, but they found, for example, that CSIS was actually giving information to foreign intelligence agencies, right, which was resulting in people being arrested, which was resulting in those people being tortured. And therefore, information that was being obtained as torture is actually being used in cases. Right? Um, not only that, they have this notion of summarizing, Mr. Maju will go into this in detail, but basically what happens is, say, somebody says something, it gets recorded, say a phone call, it's then summarized. That summary is then summarized, that summary is then summarized, and every summary prior to it is destroyed. And this, this piece appears, which is short, which you know, might be two sentences reporting on whatever, two hour conversation, etc. Um, and it now can be used as information, right? Being read by people, obviously, who are CBSA and CSIS officers who are actually entering into this from purely Islamophobic racist lens, right? And it goes on and on. I mean, CSIS was ordered, CSIS was like, oh, we've been listening to confidential phone calls between Mr. Majib and his lawyer for some six years, uh, well, 10 years, 
for 10 years. And then they were ordered to stop. And then they're like, uh, and then two years later, they're like, yeah, you ordered us to stop. We still kept going for another two years. Right? So what defense is possible where no charges are made, where the information is secret, it's obtained by torture, they're all allegations, and CSIS will listen to your solicitor client conversations. Right? So there's a lot more to that, you know, that Mr. Mahju will speak about in specific, but I just want to talk about who else has been affected by these cases. So right now, Mr. Mahju is one of three men who are still on a security certificate. Um, the, the other one, one of them is Mr. Muhammad Harkan, who just a few weeks ago, um, he was arrested in December of 2002, he's still on a security certificate. He won a big victory when the Federal Court of Appeal found that information that, um, that information where evidence or whatever, information is being destroyed, summary information is being destroyed, can't be used. So basically being like, you can't just say, oh, we destroyed everything and here's what we have. Um, the other person is Mr. Mahmoud Jabala. He was first arrested in 1999 under a security certificate. This was thrown out, it was found unreasonable. So they reissued another one in August of 2001. This one was thrown out on technical grounds. A third one was issued. This was thrown out when the Supreme Court found the legislation was unconstitutional. A fourth one was issued, and then a fifth one was issued. So essentially five times, or four times, they have found that the security certificate was unreasonable. Even by their own extremely low standards, where anything is information, um, but they just keep going ahead and issuing it. Why is that? Because it is useful to know, it is useful for the government to tell people that there is a danger. That there is a danger that is lurking around the corner. There is a shadowy subject, there is a shadowy object, a person, in this case a Muslim male, who could at any point attack, who could at any point weaken the Canadian government. And what happens in a state of fear is what, that we give up our freedoms. Right? So that is what this is about. The security certificate process is about that. Um, so, other than that, Adil Sharkawi and Hassan Al Amri, who have both had their security certificates thrown out um, in 2009, they still have not been given uh, citizenship and they're waiting for an apology. Now, I just want to end up by clearing, by just talking about what's happened. So, since 2009, no new security certificates have been issued. The reason for this is the mass amount of community organizing that has taken place in support of these five men. And I think that part of that support, part of that mobilization, are conversations like these. So we're now actually right here, part of a very important moment, where we're saying that we refuse to allow this fear to sink into us. We refuse to believe that these men are dangerous, that we're actually sitting in a room, talking to them, and whoa, nothing has happened. Right? So I think that's very, very important for us to do here. The second part of what we need to remember is that since the security certificates have stopped being issued, the government is now using other mechanisms to rush people out to the Immigration Refugee Board and deporting them. These are people that are being deported under similar national security grounds. However, they're not even ending up in court, so we don't actually know what's happening. And so we need to mobilize extremely broadly to fight off not just the security certificates, but this entire exclusionary immigration system, this culture of fear that is being generated. And so, on the 26th of June, we're organizing a mass demonstration in Toronto. The 26th of June, 2000, was the, was the date that Mr. Mahjib was arrested. He'll tell you how he was arrested. And so, on the 12th year anniversary of this, we're having a mass demonstration in Toronto. We're really encouraging everyone to come out. We're going to gather outside CSS offices. I'm sure you all want to see where that is. Um, and it's going to be a very fun, celebratory demonstration. We're going to just walk down the street being like, look at all the fear that's been generated, all the money that has been wasted, all the you know, drum beats of war that have been beaten off of the backs of these Muslim men, and we refuse to allow that to happen. So I urge you to come out. I urge you to listen carefully to Mr. Majub's story. Um, we're currently in uh, court right now, hoping that all his charges can be tossed out on an issue where of commingling, he will go into that. But if that fails, his reasonability hearings will be starting. I urge you to come to court if you can. You know, hopefully you all can have meetings after we've gone and actually try and organize buses or whatever you need to do to join us in Toronto. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming here today to hear my story and to share my ordeal with me for the last 12 years. 
I've been silent for 12 years in Canada, which is eight years in detention without a charge, four years under house arrest, three of eight in solitary confinement. Total is 12 years, it is too long. I kept silent until I have a chance to leave Toronto, which we went to six other cities across Canada, and this is the seven cities for us we are here today. My first arrest was in Egypt in 1986. I was serving in Egyptian army in a sudden they called me, they interrogated me, they arrested me for four months. I went through a lot of tortures. In Egypt, just guess because of what? After I finished my, uh, my education, I gave my, one of my schoolmates my name and my address. We left each other. I've never seen him until this moment. I've never spoke to him until this moment as well. However, he got arrested by the Egyptian authority somehow, which I'm not aware of it. Then, our plan was to continue our study in the United States. He got arrested. I got arrested based on this information. And it is it's something common in Egypt in particular, and in the Middle East, in general, as most of you or some of you are aware of what's going on in the Middle East. After I, they didn't find anything wrong against me, they let me go. I finished my military service for 15 months, but they, they kept calling me, interrogating me, and so on and so forth. They, they ended up with asking me to leave Egypt, or if I stay in Egypt, I will be detained forever. I decided to leave Egypt. I left Egypt to Saudi Arabia, then I came here in 2000. Uh, sorry, in, 19, in 1995, December 31st. <coughs> I applied by the way for refugee. Less than a year later, I was granted refugee status. Uh, however, I began to, the, to see this attention through somebody or one of security certificate uh, detainee. His phone was tapped by CSIS. He <coughs> was talking with somebody else about, they mentioned my name. That's why CSIS became interested to me. <coughs> and later, this was in, sorry, this was in, in November 1996. Between 1996 till I got arrested in, two, in July, June 26 of 2000, CSS interrogated me several times in my residence and in their office as well. At one point, there is a CSS officer, her name is Mary, interrogated me very bad and asked me about Salman Rushdie and Ayatollah Khomeini. She asked me about Salman Rushdie, about, uh, about his book. And I was naive at the time. I asked, uh, she asked me uh, Salman Rushdie and so on. I said, Salman Rushdie uh, wrote a book and he insulted Islam and he insulted Prophet Muhammad. This we are him. She became nuts. Then she started saying to me, I will insult your, uh, your Prophet Muhammad, I will insult your religion, I will insult your Lord. I say, I raised my voice a little bit. I said, miss, do your job. You can insult me, maybe I'll, I will take it. But there is no need to insult my religion, to insult my, my Lord, and so on and so forth. She threatened me to deport me. I said, you are officer. 
you have no duty to do anything except to interrogate me. Do your job. At the time, she introduced, her, she, she introduced herself to me as an immigration officer. She lied to me intentionally to try to get more information from me. Then she asked me, who is your friend, and so on and so forth. I said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna provide any names to you. You have a system. If you have some, somebody in your mind, go to the system and check that computer. You will find all information you are looking for. I'm not a snitch. I'm not uh, a kind of person to, uh, to cooperate with you guys. Anyway, uh, it takes a time, like six, four to five times they interrogated me. And during this period of time between, nine, 19, uh, between 1995 till I got arrested, CSS, as all of you are aware of, they share information with 147 countries. One of them is Egypt. They sent information about me to the Egyptian authority, which is Mubarak, the regime, which I fled from there. Then three of my brothers got arrested in July 1997, like a year and a half later, after I came to Canada, just to follow up what's happened exactly. They tortured very bad. My eldest brother was hospitalized. They released him because of his health condition after two and a half months. The other two brothers, one doctor, the other is a teacher. They detained without a charge as well for eight years. They went through a lot of kind of a torture you can imagine. Something is common in Egypt, which I don't want to go in detail about it because I still will testify in my case. Maybe I will speak about this kind of stuff. But again, the, the court in Egypt released them 25 times. The Egyptian authority re-arrested them from the back door. They spent eight years just because, of, because I'm their brother. There is nothing more at all. They interrogated very bad, tortured badly. However, they released them even without letting them know why they, they have been released. Until today, they couldn't find why they got detained and why they got released. Even after Mubarak left the uh, regime. Before I got arrested here in Canada, there is a case well known across the world it's in Egypt. It's called the Retainees from Albania case, which is 107 Egyptian individuals detained and accused for kind of stuff as they call terrorists. Most of them they convicted, including myself. I was here in Canada. This case, it was in 1999. I have been here in Canada, a free man, since 1995. I convicted for 15 years in absentia with hard labor. And in 2010, we filed a motion, it's a called torture motion, here in Canada, in my case. This motion, the current judge found out the whole information was obtained, uh, but was obtained by torture. Then he didn't rely on all kind of information, and he excluded those kind of information, and he said, I'm not gonna rely on any information related to the 15 years in absentia in my case, which is completely now it's out of, of my case. But the, the same case is still in back home. The, st still, still the same thing. I still uh, convicted or considered convicted in absentia for 15 years. Two months Two months ago, for instance, there is eight individuals in this case 
the retina from Albania, reopen the, their case before the military court. Then the court found out all of them are innocent. The court cleared their names. Two of eight got a death penalty in this case. Just guess one of them who is he? Mr. Mohammed al Zawahiri, which is the brother of Ayman al Zawahiri, the second in command in Al Qaeda, and he is number one in Al Qaeda now. His brother was convicted in this case for, for death penalty, but the court found out recently, two months ago, in March, he is innocent, then they released him, and he is a free man, and they are still here detained under the government of Canada. In my opinion, it's a shame for Canada to keep somebody under detention without a charge, without fair trial. We can't see the evidence against me, whether me or neither my lawyer as well. We are in a dark side, completely out of everything. We, we don't have anything in our hand to defend, to defend myself or my lawyer defend me. In, two, in, in, in July 26 of 2000, I was on my way to, uh, to work, and a sudden I got out of a uh, streetcar. I found, uh, I was waiting to cross the street, and a sudden I found out uh, several cars around me and uh, calling police, police, police. I was looking right and left. Who is, uh, who's, uh, who's the subject here? I find myself I am the subject. It was like a movie, honestly, because I wasn't aware of anything behind me. I wasn't concerned about anything. But in a sudden, I found myself, I'm a target. Then they said, you are a target. I said, here is my hand, guys. Then when they put me in a car, I asked them, why you didn't call me? And instead of to make a big show in the street and so on and so forth, if you call me, I will come to your office, then you can arrest me. But again, the, the, you know how is the system work? How is the agencies work? RCMB, CIC, CSA, CBSA, and so on and so forth. This is the way how is make uh, uh, their, uh, their country safe. But it is not. <coughs> they arrested me, they put me in detention, uh, at Metro's detention center. In the first moment I got, uh, I got there, I, got, uh, I was beaten very bad by five guards. One of them beat me very bad in my spine. I couldn't walk for a month and a half. I filed a complaint right away. And I spoke out about this incident. However, I don't want to go in detail. I went to court in March 2001. I came back to court. Then one of the staff asked me to strip search me. I took off all my clothes. Then uh, I, will do, I will use the same word, guys, don't be uh, sorry to use the same word. To, I, I would like to share what, what happened to me exactly. I don't want to change the word. I want you, all of you to hear what they have said to me. He asked me, bow down, I bow down. Ask me, open your ass. I said, what for? What, what, what have I hide in my ass? In a sudden, he blew up. He said to me, you are a fucking Muslim terrorist. You should be killed. People like you should be killed. I was silent. Then he turned his face to oh, around 80, uh, so, sorry, around 30 other detainees came from court. They, he said to them, why well, you didn't harm this fucking Muslim terrorist who convicted in absentia in Egypt for 15 years? I should. Because I wasn't aware of the, the whole staff at, at Metro's Detention Center is aware of my case, or, honestly. And he threatened me to put me in segregation. I kept silent again. I filed a complaint. And this man is still free. Anyone, any Muslims here or elsewhere in Canada, according to what he said, should be killed. This individual should, should be brought to justice. If there is justice here in Canada, he should be brought to justice. I got 
death threat many times. I was in general population. Both 9-11, two days later, they called me. Mahjou, come with us. I asked a lady, a captain white shirt, where I'm going? She said to me, oh, we will deport you to uh, the United States. What for? She said, 9-11. I don't give a damn about 9-11. I don't have nothing to do with 9-11. I'm already in, in detention for uh, 15, almost 15 months or 16 months before 9-11. But this is Islamophobia. Because the way how I look, the way how I practice my religion, which I doubt of myself, and each one of you, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, should be proud of your belief. You know what I mean? I said, what for? She said, we will devote to the United States. Okay. She took me to a segregation unit, took my clothes. They gave me a gown. I was naked, just a gown, a suicide watch gown, up to here, for two and a half months, with a dark sea. No light, no window for 15 days. No toilet for 15 days because they control the toilet from outside. Whenever I use number one or two, I have to smell myself all day, begging them, please, flush the toilet. Just to show you how is the system work here in Canada, guys. Don't feel you are safe. It happened to me today, it will happen to any one of you at any moment. Whether you are Muslim or non-Muslim. And all of you are aware of what happened to G20. This is a clear example to all of you. G20, how many, how many people have been detained? They do the same thing with them. They kept me in a dark cell. They gave me a paper cup to drink some water or some coffee in the morning. And the same time, I use the same cup when I use the toilet to clean myself. I asked them, please give me another cup for a toilet. They said, no, no, no. I use one cup for almost a month and a half. Water, some coffee in the morning, using, using for a toilet. In a, in a winter time, a freezing. I swear by Allah, there is no heat whatsoever. A freezing completely with someone there is no blanket, there is nothing. I asked a white shirt, please turn the heat off, uh, on a little bit. He said, when you go home, turn it on whatever, whatever you would like. And they are still free, man. I went through a lot of hunger strike. But in January 2006, in, in particular 25th of two, January 2000, uh, 2002, sorry, they called me to go to see my family. They come to visit me. I went there. They said to me, your family didn't show up. OK, they called me back to, to a segregation unit. I was subject to, strip, to be strip search at any moment, any times. I leave my, uh, my cell or I come back. Even 10 times a day, I have to be strip search 20 times. I don't have nothing at all in, in my city. But this is, a, this is what they did to me only, because there is other two security certificate cases in the same uh, segregation. They didn't do anything with them, because I stood up for my dignity and for my right. I don't like anyone to, to any, anybody to humiliate me by any means. From the beginning, I was very clear to them. I, I will stand up for my right. Doesn't matter what's gonna cost me. I understand what the circum circumstance will be. But again, one of the staff who stand up searched me tried to assault to, to sexual assaulted me. I was he asked me to bow down, I bow down and asked me, put your hand in your ass. Otherwise I will read you. There was, was three witnesses. One of them, white shirt. And the white shirt is the one who gave him instruction to do it. And all of them are still free men. I, I was yelling, asking for help. And the other two detainees, which is Mr. Mahmoud Jaballah and Mr. Hassan Omri, heard me yelling for help. Just guess, when a police came to investigate this incident, 
The superintendent in charge, his name is Mike Richard, asked me, Mahjoub, when you go to see the, uh, the police, don't lie charge against this uh, guard. I said, call my lawyer. I need my lawyer to be present when a police investigates this incident. I gave him my, cell, my lawyer's phone number, but he didn't show up again. Just to show you, and all of them are still free men in this country. I went through a lot of hunger strike, which I start with the sexual assault incident. But the other, uh, the other hunger strike was based on, I was asking for medical treatment. They refused. Each time I asked for medical treatment, I will give you one incident. I had infection in my teeth. I applied eight times, and each time I both request, they asked me to be paid, asking me, you have to pay us. I said, I'm, I'm a detainee. I'm in detention, guys. And we have a dentist in, in, uh, in, det in detention. We have a special unit for this. They said, no, no, no. But in, any other individual or any other inmate, was allowed to, to, to see a dentist within fifth, maximum within 15 days. But they left me for eight months without the treatment, without medication at all, until I lost five of my teeth. Then when I saw a dentist, he said to me, hey, you are in jail. I asked him, doctor, why you didn't call me for the last eight months? He said, oh, you are in jail. He is one of my jailers. He should be prosecuted. It is not only him. The, the, the head of, the, the head of, uh, the, uh, of detention as well. There's many things happened. Just to show you how, how they mislead the whole entire nation. I went to, I went to court in 2001, for instance, with, with other inmates in one vehicle. But when we went to court in 2004 and 2005 for uh, uh, Bill Healy, just guess what happened? They called me, they took me with like five to eight black vehicle, 10 white motorcycle, like barricade, a helicopter over my head, shut down the whole way from uh, Metro Detention Center until uh, the courthouse, with machine gun, sniper, uh, laser gun, Like, I, I will blow up the whole entire world. I am already in detention for uh, five years. Why you make a big show? Why you, this, is, this is a kind of misleading, intentionally misleading a public, misleading a court, intimidating a judges. All judge. If, a judge, if I'm a judge, I, I, I see that the whole entire nation do this. How can I make a right decision? You know what I mean? They intimidate a judge. A judge refused to, to give me, to grant me uh, bail. This is one incident just to share it with you. Another incident when they took me from uh, Metro West Detention to uh, KIHC, which uh, Dr. Mustafa Fahmi here, may Allah help him, uh, he is the one who assists us a lot over there because he was in, 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 uh, in Kingston at the time as acting as a chaplain to us. When they took me from there, from Metro's detention to uh, KHC, which Canadian call, call KHIC, uh, KIHC, they called it Get Monors or Guantanamo Nors. I prefer to call it concentration camp. The reason I, call, I called it concentration camp because Hitler, in the past, he built a, a specific camp for Jew. This jail built only for five Muslims. It designed for five sale. We didn't see anybody else with us. That's why I called it concentration camp as Hitler's concentration camp for, for Jew. This is one thing. The second thing, they made a study on us they study our behavior as well. They didn't put us there just for fun. They study our behavior, how we can interact with each other. 
I will give you one example. When Jabala went to court in, 19, in 2006, the prosecutor said, oh, Mahjoub and Jabala was sitting with each other more than they were sitting with Harakat and Hassan al -Umm. Just to show you how, how, how their mentality is working. I would like to share also with you one particular information. One of the security certificate lawyer said in, in a statement, if the government of Canada put the, the five Muslim detainees in the best hotel in, in Toronto, they will save, in, in the best hotel in Toronto, they will save $1.5 million a year. The reason he said it, because the government of Canada spent eight years on us around $2.5 million. They built this unit for $2.5 million on the Mill Haven land. Then, the last year, they quietly closed. They closed this, this, uh, this concentration camp forever. Who made this money? Is all of you here and others work hard in the street. My estimate for how much money the government of Canada spent on, on five Muslim detainees is one billion dollars, maybe more. This is my estimate based on how I see how much money they spent with lawyer, with so and so. I have massive information about how much money they spent. There is one particular piece of information uh, it's an uh, article in uh, Global Mail, as I, as I can recall, like two, two years ago, published. It said in two years, 2005, 2006, they spent $65 million on us. How many thousands of homelesses outside, they, they need this money? In, in Toronto, only 75,000 homelesses. It's a, it's a huge number. If they spent $1 million on education or homelessness or health care, it would be better. But again, none of us got a charge. Two of us are free, and they will be free, inshallah, soon. Uh, <laughs> uh, at any time, my, my family came to visit me when I was in detention, they refused. They banished my little kids when, when they participate in a rally around Metro's detention center. They banished my kids next time when they came to visit me, they said, no, 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 we are not going to allow you to visit your dad. Why? What for? What, what's wrong? What we did? They said, oh. He was participating in the rally uh, for, your, uh, for, your, uh, for your dad. However, I don't want to take a lot of uh, time with you. I have, this is a 12 years. It is not a 12 days or 12 months. It's a 12 years. I have a massive of, of, of incident to share it with you. When I was in detention, in Admit Rose Detention Center, just guess what happened? Bunch of my jailer, made a conspiracy against me and they, they, they wrote a letter accusing me I was planning to kill five of my jailers at segregation. Then they called the police, they called RCMB, they called uh, OBB, they called handwriting expert. But alhamdulillah, nothing against me at all. My hand it's a clear and the clean than the hand of Jesus, CBSA, and my jail. A 12 year without, without a charge. I'm proud of myself. I say it to you here. I say it everywhere. My hand is more clean. When it comes to crime, my hand is clean and the clear than the hand of Jesus, CBSA, and my jail as well. <clears throat> They destroyed, uh, in, at, at concentration camp, they destroyed my CD Quran and 
Mr. Dr. Mustafa Fahmi is the eyewitness as well. I showed it to him, and he is aware of this incident. They try their best to break me down. I said, there is no way. I guarantee you, you will the one who will give up. I'm not going to give up at all, inshallah. I will fight, and I will continue fighting for my right and for any other people who go, will go through hardship. If I can assist anybody, I will do, inshallah. After I, uh, the, the, the court decided to release me, they released me in 2007, until 2002, uh, until 2009, my family was under unacceptable and unimaginable uh, condition. A 24-7 physical surveillance, a 24-7 Tabbing, uh, intercepting, uh, full line, uh, fax, internet, the internet fax, and so on is behind the uh, door closed. Uh, no one can't enter our residence until proven by uh, the authority. And uh, our mail is intercepted, uh, copied, uh, shared it with other agencies, maybe with other countries, and so on and so forth. My, my kids not allowed to have uh, some, some other kids to play with them in our house until we have a proof from CBSA. Uh, the whole family is completely collapsed. One, one incident, my, my wife was uh, pregnant, then uh, she had a miscarriage. I called my jailer, which is CBSA, to take her to hospital. They uh, let me go and asked me, take your wife by ambulance. Then I called ambulance, it came, and one of the staff, Ask me, Mahjoub, I will take your, your kids with me in, in a car and go with your, your wife. And I trusted him. And instead of who, he's supposed to follow, to, to, follow, to follow up me, step by step. And instead of following up me, he tied up my kids. It was in the summertime. He tied up my kids in, in a car for two hours. I swear to God, I'm not lying to you. For two hours. He left me and my wife free. We went there for two hours. Then he called his uh, superior, talking about me and so on and so forth. When he showed up after two hours, he threatened the whole department in the hospital to shut down the, the hospital and to call the uh, task force. What for? Then the security, security manager of the hospital, she came to me, Mr. Mahjou, come with us. I said, what for? She said, there is somebody uh, there uh, make a big, big scene. Then my wife has to decide. She said to her, if my husband is going to leave me, we have to live together. And just sign here, if something happened to me, it will, it will be your responsibility. Then she decided not to, to, to let me go. She calls this individual, which is, his name is uh, one of the CBSA uh, uh, supervisor. His name is Hartsibul. This individual is completely unsense. He, he has no mind by any means. He has no heart. Because my wife was in, in, in a hospital. He tied my kids. Then he came to threaten the, the whole department to shut down by a task force. Then he wrote a false report, complete false report. Accusing my wife, she made a big scene, and she accused the staff, and so on and so forth, which we wasn't aware of it. One of his colleagues told us. He told us, you can't imagine what this man wrote about your wife. This man, this individual is still free. He's still working in CBSA, but in, in different uh, branch. My wife and my kids couldn't take it. I saw my wife and my kids completely collapse, completely broke down. I decided to take it on me again. And I called the CBSA, I called my jailer. Come to arrest me. Otherwise, I will come to your office to surrender myself, which I did. They said, well, you didn't do anything wrong. We're not going to come to your, your house. I said, fine. I called a taxi. I went to their office. 
I said that myself, I went, to go, uh, I went back to detention for one more year. But since then, the family has collapsed. The family dropped down, we, we deforest. Because of the CDC and, and this, this, this government. Those people are, are, are machines in a human form, which I say it to them. It is not the first time. I say it to them, I say it in public. You are a machine in a human form. You ha they have no home. Honestly, they have no home. They have no future, in my opinion. They, attract, they try to break down families, individual, and so on and so forth. If I did, if I did something wrong, it charged me. But I did it 12 years without a charge, without any trial, without having seen any, any, uh, any evidence against me. Now, I didn't see my, my family, my kids, since then until today. What is the justice here? How can I defend myself? The government of Canada hijacked, has hijacked my freedom and my, my right for 12 years <coughs> here in Canada. It is not only me, my family, my wife, or my ex-wife, and my kids. The same thing happened in Egypt for my family as well by the Egyptian authority. But again, Canada has detained me on behalf of Hosni Mubarak. Because when I came to Canada, I filed my complaint or my case against Hosni Mubarak's regime. <coughs> I'm, uh, in my opinion, I'm a political prisoner. I didn't commit any crime. <coughs> I didn't commit any crime. If I commit a crime, they will charge me, <coughs> but they can't. They can't charge me, which they, they admitted in another case, which is Mr. Hassan al-Omri's case. They said, in his case, we don't have evidence or enough evidence to charge him. It means automatically it's applied to all of us as well. Recently, we found out the government of Canada caught with several scandals in my case. For instance, there was spying on me and my lawyer for 10 years. All my communication with my lawyer, because I'm under house arrest or in detention, by four with my lawyer. All our plan for my case on the phone as well. They are ahead on us. They knew our plan. They knew our strategy. <coughs> they knew everything in our mind. How can we make a progress? We can't make a progress. If somebody is spying on your phone and both of you, for instance, talking about X and X is the one interested, you can't make any uh, progress or any advance at all. This is, this is one big scandal, which is prohibited by law. <coughs> but again, CSS was intercept our phone on behalf of CBSA, then the CBSA gives them a uh, red li uh, green line to uh, retain certain information. They can use it against me, which is, uh, <coughs> is illegal. Because the, the one supposed to intercept my phone call with any individual except my lawyer is CBSA. But they retain CSS to intercept my phone call based on CSS are interested interested in my case. This is one scandal. The second scandal, torture, which I explained to you. Since 2000, until 2010, the CSS was misleading the minister when they signed the certificate based on information obtained by torture. But now there is no uh, more information. Okay, this is the second scandal. The third scandal is uh, destruction of evidence. Whenever they, they have communication or if they have uh, any information from the third party, 
they summarize this information, they keep the summary, then they destroy the original thing, then they make summary of the summary of the summary. One, I have in my hand one particular piece of information, it is summarized eight times. I swear to that it eight times. <coughs> Just imagine. And accidentally, I was lucky and my lawyer. Accidentally, they gave us one of the original summary. When we compare to both of them, completely, completely different. You can't imagine. One hand, something makes sense. The other hand, completely, you can't, you can't say this is the same. Uh, this is the same uh, conversation. This is a service scandal, fourth scandal. Last summer, for instance, in 2011, we had a court. After we finished our court, we left our material in court. Because this is a court room, for instance, and here is breakout room for Mahjoub and his council, and the other, right, the other side, breakout room for Crown and his, uh, or their, their client. Our room was full of material. It has around more than 60 bucks, full of material. Just guess what happened. The government, the Department of Justice lawyer, is stolen our material. They enter our room. They took all our material. They transferred it to the Department of Justice's office. They kept it there for two months. They searched it for 10 days. They analyze it for different folders. Then they come up with, sorry guys, we have some document of Mahjoub's uh, counsel. It's related to Mahjoub's lawyer. But a week later they said, oh, sorry, we have a massive uh, document. They ended up saying, we saw only two words out of 64 bucks, which they searched for 10 days. They copy our material inside the Department of Justice, outside the Department of Justice, without taking any uh, security measure. They send it to somebody, please go there. Even they didn't make a list which documents they need, or they copy. And they said, oh, sorry, we, we take it accidentally. Again, we found out later, one of the, the Department of Justice's lawyer gave an instruction to his assistant to copy our material. We discovered all this kind of mess by ourselves. It takes seven months to separate our document from their document because they mixed up our document with their document to make it look, look oh, we, we took it accidentally. Can any one of you tell me how can I defend myself after this scandal? In the absence of fair trial, in the absence of evidence, how can I defend myself? How, how can my lawyer defend me? Where is the justice here? In my opinion, there is no justice whatsoever. It's a mountain of mess by CSIS, CBSA, by the government of Canada. I would like to end it up my uh, speech to you today or my story saying I am in the store to make a very simple demand to Jason Kenney and Vic Toz, which is the uh, public safety minister, immediately to withdraw my case. It is not only my case alone, but the other security certificate cases as well based on the scandal after scandal after scandal, which I can't take it anymore. There is no just. Thank you so much for having me today, and God bless all of you. Yeah, <clears throat> towards like 
this, fighting this kind of campaign, um, take resources, they take people like you. Uh, Murray here is uh, accompanying the student, uh, Luke, uh, working with the help pay his expenses, and the expenses of the ongoing campaign. There's also a petition over here. There's a petition here, you want to tell us what the petition's about? Yeah, it's about the security certificate, and uh, what it says is statement against security certificates. Please sign, even if you previously to stay uh, and get information about Mr. Mizzou. Because if you, if you put your email, it's got name, address, email, uh, a couple of other, other things. But if you put your email address, uh, you can be added to a list and receive further information as well. There's a I'll pen here. I guess that could be passed around or yeah. you just go ahead and start it around. So the other two men are Mr. Harcourt and Mr. Duvall. Mr. Harcourt is based in Ottawa. Um, he has to stay there except when he supervises. Mr. Duvall is based in uh, Scarborough, just outside of Toronto. And uh, he's just had his conditions changed so he can move within the GTA but not outside of it. Um, the other two men are Dil Sharkawi and Hassan and Amri, who both had their security certificates withdrawn in 2009. Um, so thank you, <coughs> I certainly know that it's just a good uh, quite some time. 